Okay, so a couple of things off the top. If you go to the oh, Canvas page. So I think since last class, I did say I was gonna put up a fifth Excel and Connect. So I put up the fifth Connect homework, and then I'll put up the Excel after class today. Uh, it's basically gonna be all kind of linear regression stuff. So after today, you can start working on it, get through a little bit of it. And then after Friday, I think we should have pretty much the, the bulk of, of understanding done to where you can kind of complete all of those assignments. We'll kind of keep continuing to talk about linear regression next week. So we'll just be getting more and more practice with it. Um, but those, I'll, I will get that fifth Excel assignment up as soon as we're, well, I have a meeting after class, but as soon as that meeting's done after class, I'll get that up there. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, I also have under the files and the in-class data folder, I have a linear regression files folder. So we'll be working with a lot of these files today. So this is where they, they all are located. And I'll, uh, I'll probably be posting kind of like, the GPA one today, I'll post a GPA data in class work with some of the work that we did as well. So that in mind. So up to this point, right, we've really been focusing on the differences between groups or between means, but we're gonna take a slightly different um, route and look at the relationship between two variables. So we've talked about in the past, we had measures of this, like the correlation coefficient and the covariance. You know, if they were positive, that meant as X goes up, Y also goes up. If they're negative, as X goes up, Y tends to be lower. And then if it's zero, as X goes up, Y doesn't really change at all. All right, this is kind of going way back when we looked at these things. We can actually come up with a, be uh, a better measure of the relationship between this X and Y variable. So if we think about, we wanna know, you know, how can I predict Y? If as X goes up, is was Y gonna get larger? Is it gonna get smaller? Is it not really gonna change? And I can do that using kind of a, a, a linear line. Right? So I'm gonna kind of skip around the slides a little bit today. And I'm really gonna to try to combine a lot of what's in the slides here. The next thing that I'm gonna do and give us a really good setup for what we're really ultimately gonna to try to be doing with linear regression. Okay. So let me go to the dot cam here. Okay, so let's say we have some X and some Y variable. We'll call this kind of years of education down here, and then maybe our Y variable is income. Okay. So if we looked at the data, there would be a bunch of different observations but for each observation, we're gonna have a X and Y val value, right? That person's years of education and that person's income. And we could then just plot every single observation using those X and Y coordinates, right? Basically creating a scatter plot. Right? What I'm then gonna think about doing is, so I know that I could write out a linear relationship between my X and Y uh, variable. So here, you know, you could think about, you know, maybe what we're, we're doing here is income is gonna be some function of education. Well, what are these A and B values gonna be? What is the intercept and what is the slope? Well, if I was able to draw a line that best fit that data, this line would have an intercept value down here. And, you know, we could calculate what the slope of that line is. Now, you know, here what I'm doing, I'm just kind of eyeballing it. So if I drew that line of best fit, I could figure out what these values actually were. Right? So ultimately with linear regression, in order to understand the relationship between our X and our Y variable, we're gonna try to figure out what A and B values would give us this line of best fit. Okay? And we'll define line of best fit a little bit more in detail here in a second, but we're trying to get this line of best fit, which would correspond to certain intercept and slope values. Okay? So I think what I had in the slides there, just to kind of follow along. Oh, come on, All right? Oh, I'll, I'll come back to this slide in a second. So notice, Kind of if we have 
this, this setup, we can kind of get this line of best fit. So if I had something that looked like this, that slope or B would be zero, right? As X goes up, you know, Y just does whatever it wants. So we have a kind of this flat line or a slope of zero. If I had a relationship that looked like this, yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I'm waiting for the slide to catch up here in class. There we go. So right here was kind of our relationship where the slope was equal to zero, B was equal to zero. Here's a relationship where B would be positive, right? And here's a relationship where B would be, oops, negative. Now we're always gonna just estimate linear lines. I will say that if you're gonna continue into the next, you know, to take 321 or 424, the stats courses in the business school or other things, uh, some of the other upper level courses, you might start to do things with nonlinear relationships. We're not gonna do this, do that in this class. We'll just kind of strictly focus on these linear relationships. Okay. So a couple terms before we move any further. We're gonna call this y variable or our left hand side variable that's the dependent variable it depends on our x variable our x variable or our right hand side variable we're going to call the independent variable it's what is changing and when it changes independently the dependent y variable will then also change the result right so independent variable x is what's going to change on its own and then as X changes, our dependent variable Y will change accordingly. Okay. And then regression analysis is basically the tool that we're going to use to come up with the A and B value that gives us this line of best fit. Okay. Such as some terms. If we go back to thinking about this line of best fit, we'll start to kind of define things a little bit. Okay. When I write out the relationship between X and Y, what I'm really thinking about here is, if I were to obtain the values for A and B, I could plug in different values of X and I could come up with what we're gonna call the predicted Y value. Okay. So we're predicting Y, we'll call that Y hat. Each observation, we could figure out what the actual Y value was though, right? We have the actual Y value in the data set. So, I'm gonna try to get this to show up pretty good. If we think about any one X value, so let's say we choose this X value, I don't know, maybe it's like 12 years of education. For this observation, right? I'm gonna draw this over real quick. I'll, I'll flip it around, but I'm, I'm not good enough at drawing straight lines to, I'm, I'm, they're still not straight, but <laughs> um, there we go. So if I plugged 12 in to this equation, I could come up with my predicted y value right that would be the point up on that line of best fit that's the predicted y value the actual y value from the data point was somewhere down here so the difference between these two we're going to call epsilon or the error right our error term is really simply going to be take the actual y value and subtract the predicted y value So, you know, if I define the error term as the difference between the actual Y value, wherever that data point was and the predicted Y value, the point I would have been on at that X value on my line of best fit, that's my error term. Notice here, my prediction was too high. So I'm actually gonna have a negative error term here. I could think about, you know, what if I were to look at this observation? Well, here I've got my predicted Y down here. The actual y is up here. So now if I think about my epsilon, it's going to be positive. Right? But you can kind of think about for every single one of these observations, I could look at the difference between the actual y and the predicted y or the, you know, where that would be at in the line of best fit. And I would have an error term for every single observation. Okay, So for every single observation, I would have an error term. So we've now skip ahead we've defined this error term we're getting there so what's going to be true is that the difference to my predicted and actual y is just whatever the error term is and this will be specific to every individual if you think about if i'm trying to predict somebody's income based off of education well, there's a lot of other factors that matter and you know bill gates's error term is going to be a lot different than you know i don't know 
someone that's, uh, you know, kind of a, I don't know, choose your, your, your job, right? A firefighter in Montier, something like that, right? So our error terms are going to be different for every single observation. So we'll define the actual Y as being the predicted Y, which is just this guy right here, plus the error term, right? So we can come up with that predicted Y, and then, we, oops, then if we think about the actual Y is just the predicted Y plus the error term. So with this in mind, right, I kind of already drew this out for us. We've got error terms for every single observation. So what I'm going to do is now I need to figure out, okay, I kind of have the concept of what I'm doing. I'm looking for this A and B value for this line of best fit that best fits the data. But what is a best fit? What, what does that mean, right? So the way that we're going to define best fit is we're going to try to choose these A and B values so that we minimize the sum of the squared errors. So first to think about it, we'll just think about all these error terms. When I draw this line of best fit, maybe the easiest way to think about, I'm just trying to minimize the sum of all these errors, right? If I were to look at all the errors I'm making and add them up, I want to minimize that, right? I want to choose the line that I'm making the smallest amount of errors. That, I think that makes sense. You know, if I had a line that was like, I drew this as my line of best fit, well, my errors are going to be huge for every observation. My predictions are going to be terrible, right? So I'm trying to choose a line that minimizes the sum of all these errors. Furthermore, I'm not just trying to minimize um, the sum of my errors, but the sum of my squared errors. So one thing the square will do, first of all, it doesn't matter which direction I'm making the error. I don't care if the error is positive or negative. That just is telling me I'm off, right? So by squaring it, I make it so that the direction I'm off doesn't matter. But I also am going to really penalize really large errors, right? Because one squared is still one, two squared is four, right? Or, you know, four squared is 16, right? So really extreme errors that I'm making are going to like add a lot more, right? Into that um, sum of the squared error term, okay? So with that idea in mind, I'm basically going to have this equation I can write out. Maybe. Here we go. I'm trying to minimize this equation. The sum of, and the difference between y and the predicted y is the error. So the sum of the errors squared. Right. How do I how do I do that? Well, if I'm trying to minimize a function, right, I'll write out the predicted y with the two things that I'm trying to choose or trying to solve for. What are a and b? If I'm trying to minimize, I can take a derivative in respect to a and b, set them equal to zero, two equations, two unknowns, right? And then, you know, then it's just a matter of kind of solving that mathematically, right? Taking the derivatives, you know, I've got two equations, two unknowns. It's just a matter of, of doing the math. I'm not going to, you know, worry too much about that. I don't know why I put this slide in here again. Oh, I think I, I probably should delete that. I think I wrote out here just to kind of indicate this is the error term, right? So we have those two equations, two unknowns. If we were to solve that, we come up with this equation or these two equations for the kind of A and B value that would give you the line of best fit. So notice it's using the data, right? Every single observation, that X value and the difference between the actual X value times that observation's Y value, the difference between the average Y value add them all up. Like I can kind of imagine, and I'll show you by the end of the class, like how you could do this in Excel. Okay. Um, but this is what the equation will always kind of, you know, boil down to be. Here's like another version. We could rewrite it in a slightly different way. Don't worry about these equations too much at all, because I'm not going to have you do any of this, right? We'll see that there's a you know, powerful tool in Excel that makes it so we don't have to do all this work by hand. But this does highlight that we're really just coming up with estimates here based off of the data set we have. Right? So this is how we're going to be choosing those A and B values, right? We've got our formulas now. We know that will give that to us. So, um, you know, we could go through the steps. Like I said, I'm not going to have you do this. I'll show you how to do it in Excel, but it's, you know, kind of a waste of our time because we have this other method we can use. This built in, it kind of does basically does all this work for us. So let's take a look at that. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Let's take a look at that here real quick. I'm going to be working with this GPA data, right? That's the file that I'm going to be working with. I'm going to zoom in so you can see a little bit easier. 
So what I'm going to be thinking about here is the following. So I'll write this big so you can see it. So I'm thinking maybe I can predict GPAs using SAT scores, right? Now I'm going to come up with my predicted GPAs, right? This is the, I'm trying to run this regression so that it would spit out at me the estimates for A and B. So what I'm going to do, and this is a little bit different on a Mac, and I'm going to try to find a good source and post it up on, uh, on as, a, like as an announcement on Canvas that shows you kind of the step by steps with a Mac. I know it's a little bit different for older versus newer, newer Macs. I believe that you go underneath the tools section on the Mac. Um, then on a PC will go files and then down here to options. So if there's a way to get to kind of your options in Excel on a Mac and you're already aware of that, you want to get to that options where you can kind of change some of the settings. So file options on a PC. Once, or if you're on a Mac, if you go to that tools, you should have like a tools option. Sometimes the add-ins is under that tools option. Honestly, probably a quick Google search of, of adding, uh, adding analysis tool pack to whatever year your Mac is, is probably the easiest way to do it. Like I said, it kind of depends. Some of the older Macs, it's a little bit different. So once you find those add-ins, if you go to manage those add-ins and make sure the analysis tool pack has a check mark next to it, once you do that, when you go to your data tab, you should have that data analysis option right on the right hand side. So this will be important in order to kind of do that fifth Excel assignment. So, um, or even parts of the connect. So, you know, I have the steps outlined for a PC on slide 29. All right. Like I said, um, the beginning part for those of you with a Mac, I don't think it's files options. I think it's usually like you go to tools and then you can find the add-ins through there. If you're having any difficulties with that and can't figure out, send me an email and I can try to kind of kind of troubleshoot and walk you through getting that added in. Okay. Any questions up to this point, by the way? I haven't kind of stopped here for a second, so I'll make sure I'm giving you guys. Okay. So I now go to this data analysis. I can move this down to regression, hit OK. My Y variable, right, I'm going to select is college GPAs, right? So kind of our shortcut there, control shift or command shift on a Mac, hit the down arrow. It's going to select that entire column. What do I want is my X variable. This is a pain. I'm going to scroll to the top because I accidentally selected everything ahead of time. Oh, come on. Okay, my X variable that I was going to be using to predict GPAs, remember, was SAT scores. So I'm going to select Control Shift, Command Shift on a Mac, hit the down arrow. I've now selected my two variables. I selected the names of those variables, so I need to make sure I click that I selected the labels. And you can put this on the same worksheet or on a new worksheet. I usually just default to a new worksheet just to make it easier to see. So I hit OK. I now can see that I've got my regression output. It's going to look something like this. So it identifies the number of observations. It's got some other statistics that we haven't talked about yet that we really don't need to focus too much on yet. Now, if I go down here, I'm going to just make these bigger so we can see. The four things we're going to really use are these first four columns. So the coefficient is just another word for what our estimate was for A and B. So the intercept coefficient, and then here kind of the slope coefficient on our SAT score variable. That's what these coefficients are. They're the estimates for what the values of A and B should be, or the intercept and our slope. They are just estimates. So some other things that we're given are test statistics and p-values. So where is that really coming from? Come on, get out here. So I'm trying to get an estimate, say, for the slope. What's going to end up being true is that there's a distribution. It depends on, right? I could have many different samples of, of students that with GPA and SAT scores. Let me get this straight. So the distribution of those estimates that I will come up with for the slope will be normally distributed, as long as I have a sample size over 30, around whatever that true 
relationship is between SAT scores and GPAs. I can come up with a estimate of that based off of my sample or a sample statistic. And that sample statistic will be centered around whatever the true population value is, right? This is what we've been doing with means, proportions, differences in means. And then if it's easier to kind of relate what we're doing now to kind of some old stuff, we're also gonna have something that we see in the Excel output called kind of our standard error, right? S epsilon. An easier way to maybe to think about this is, it's kind of like the standard deviation for those kind of sample slope coefficient, coefficients or those the standard deviation of those slope estimates, right? So that's what our standard error is. Those two things are, are kind, of, kind of the same. This isn't how we write it, but this is maybe a good way to think about it and relating it to what we've been doing in the past. So what ends up being true is I can do things like create a test statistic. So I just take the sample statistic that I found, right? Whatever that slope coefficient estimate is, I subtract, well, I would ideally select or subtract the actual kind of slope value but I can come up with an assumed true slope value. And then I'll divide by, well, if we had an equation that gave us the standard deviation for that sample statistic or the um, kind of estimate we have for the slope, well, this is actually just our standard error. And we're always gonna use an assumed true slope of zero. So actually our test statistic equation just becomes, take that coefficient estimate and divide it by the standard error which we have these here. Now it gives us the test statistic, but just to kind of show you all Excel is doing is it's taking that slope coefficient and dividing it by the standard error for that variable. That's how it's coming up with that test statistic, right? That easy. Okay. Now we have a test statistic. The degrees of freedom is a much, is something we're not gonna dive into into this class but there is a degrees of freedom for your regression. And you could actually then look up your test statistic in the correct student T distribution, find the P value. I'm never gonna have you do that, but I am gonna have you use this P value, okay? So what is, what, you know, what, what's our hypothesis test here? How do we have a P value? Well, with this idea in mind, right? If there's, if there's a distribution, what we're always gonna do, and I said that the assumed true kind of slope is always zero because I'm always gonna start out assuming that that true slope is zero because what I'm trying to find is that there is some relationship between the X and Y variable or that the slope is something other than zero. So this is always gonna be my hypothesis test when I'm looking at this regression result. So now it just becomes just like it was before. I look at the P value on my coefficient, right? Cause I, that, that was given the output in Excel and we'll take a look at it here in a second. If it's less than alpha, and the alphas we'll kind of look, use are 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, same as before. If I get a p-value that's less than my alpha, I say I can reject the null. Well, what am I rejecting? I always start out assuming there's no relationship. So if I find a low enough p-value, I'm rejecting that there's no relationship. Or said differently, I found strong evidence that there is a relationship. The slope is something other than zero. So if we look here, on the SAT variable, we get a p-value of two times, well, no, two times 10 to the, what, negative 166. So move the decimal point 166 spots to the left. This is basically zero. It's easier to think about here. We have a p-value of zero, right? It's gonna be less than any alpha. So we found that there is a, we can reject the null hypothesis that there's no relationship. But we found very strong evidence that there is a relationship between the SAT score uh, and GPAs high school, you know, I guess that's T score in high school and college GPAs. Any questions over anything there? Let me kind of move on to the, the kind of next topic here. So when I think about starting to do some, what we're going to call interpretations for my slope, all right, this is the uh, interpretation of a slope coefficient, right? So a coefficient on my X variable. All right, this is, uh, or you think about this as uh, the interpretation of that slope value B. So the general form of the interpretation is going to be a one unit increase in the X variable predicts um, 
that the y variable increases or decreases by whatever that coefficient value is. Okay. So a one unit increase in the x variable predicts that the y variable goes up or down by whatever that coefficient is. I say up or down because if it's negative, it'd be a decrease, right? So here in the context of our example, a one unit increase in the SAT score would be one more point on the SAT right, predicts that uh, an individual's college GPA increases by 0 0.0019. So all I did was kind of take that general interpretation and put it in the context of my example, right? A one unit increase, so one more point in the SAT, right? One unit increase in the X variable, our X variable is SAT, predicts that our Y variable, or predicts that an individual's college GPA increases by that coefficient amount of 0 0.0019, okay? So this is how we do our interpretations of that slope coefficient. Now, if I know the effect of one point, what if they do 100 points higher on the SAT? Well, if the predicted increase in the GPA from one more point is 0 0.0019, which seems really small, but yeah, one point, what's the difference between getting a 1200 and a 1201, right? Not much, right? But what about instead of getting a 1200, we get a 1300? Well, that would be a 100 point increase. So 100 points times the effect of one additional point, right? If I know the effect of one additional point, the effect of 100 would be that times 100. The effect of 200 points would be the coefficient times 200, right? So if I score 100 points higher than the SAT, I predict that person's GPA would be 0.19 points higher, which still might not seem like much, but right, GPAs only go from zero to four anyway, so we don't have a lot of room to kind of increase and decrease. So this kind of makes sense. So that's how we can kind of take that slope coefficient and find the effect of, of various, you know, not just one unit, but multiple units, just simply multiplying by the number of units you want. What about the intercept, right? So if I'm trying to interpret that coefficient, this one can get a little bit weird, right? So the general interpretation is the, uh, how do I have this written out? So the predicted Y value, if the X variable is equal to zero. Right? So in our example, that would be the predicted GPA is 0.663 if the individual got a zero on the SAT, right? So if that X variable is a zero, our intercept coefficient is the predicted Y value. Any questions on that? And that might seem a little, a little goofy. Here it kind of makes sense, right? If I got a zero on the SAT, I, my GPA should be pretty low, should start out pretty low. But the interpretation of this intercept can get a little bit weird sometimes. So instead of this output, I'm going to show you what it could have looked like, uh, maybe if I had been given a different sample. If I can get this paper to. Okay. So it could have looked something like this. Right? Let's say I had SATs and GPA, and I had. I don't know, I had like all my data, right? Right here. So in practice, like we don't see people get fives, tens, twenties on the SAT, right? We don't see people getting these extreme, I mean, if you just show up and you take it, you're at least getting a couple hundred or something, right? So most of the data is gonna lie over here. So if I draw this line of best fit, we'll notice it would actually have a negative intercept, right? So let's say this, you know, I come up and this was like negative 0.66. Well, the interpretation of the intercept is if the X variable is equal to zero, so if I get a zero on the SAT, my predicted GPA is negative, I can't have a negative GPA. That's still the interpretation. That's still how we'll interpret because it's essentially like this starting point that we never actually see any data down here. So when we come up with these predicted GPAs, 
we're never going to have a negative predicted GPA because we never see an X value that's like below a certain threshold. So sometimes if the data is kind of like laying way over to the right, we might end up with a negative intercept. And then when we go to interpret the intercept, it seems like a weird, weird interpretation, but that's still how we interpret it, right? So, oh, sorry, I had written down the number negative 0.66 here. And the reason why we interpret it that way is because if we think about what we're doing, well, I'll write it out in the context of this example, right? GPA A plus B times SAT. If the X variable is zero, this goes away and our predicted value of Y is just whatever the intercept is, right? That's why it's, that's why it's, a, that is a, it's interpretation. Also, you can think about the interpretation of the slope is the way it is, is because really the slope is telling me that if the X value goes up by one, how much does the Y value go up, right? Or the predicted increase in the Y value. So we're really just kind of interpreting um, what the intercept and slope mean in the context of our example. Any questions on this before we keep moving? Let me see where we're at in time. Okay. Okay, so we'll take a look at another example here. So, so I have this data set and it's got um, two variables, income and the number of days somebody uses marijuana each month. Right? I have, you know, 5,000 observations. The, the income's a little low. This is like, um, first of all, this is an older data set coming from like starting in 1979. And it has a, a high represented, um, highly represented the youth. So it's a lot of younger individuals. That's why the income isn't, isn't that high. Right? Now I'm gonna show you the output that we might see from not Excel, but another kind of statistical program that I use called Stata. So I'll, I'll usually try to you know, show you Excel um, data, but sometimes I'll sprinkle in some of this stuff so we can kind of see that it looks a little bit different, but as long as we know what we're looking for, we can still use really any program's output. So here I ran this regression where I had my dependent or my Y variable, the income, my independent or my X variable was the number of days I use marijuana each month. I then kind of run this regression to come up with a predicted value for the intercept coefficient and the slope coefficient. Now, one thing that some statistical programs will do, unlike Excel, it doesn't call it the intercept, it calls it the constant. Two, two, name, you know, two different names for the same thing, intercept or the constant. So my coefficient on the intercept, I've got here, my coefficient for my X variable, I've got right here, I've got their standard errors, I've got their test statistics, I've got their p-values, right? That's all, that's all I need, right? That's I said, we're gonna focus on those first four, okay? First four columns. So here, how would I interpret the coefficient on my X variable number of, excuse me, days someone uses marijuana a month? Well, the general interpretation was a one unit increase in our X variable causes the predicted Y value to change by whatever the coefficient is. So a one unit increase here would be using marijuana one additional day a month would predict that incomes go, your income goes down by $253. How would I interpret the intercept or the constant? Well, it, the general interpretation is this is the predicted Y value if our X variable is equal to zero. So if someone uses marijuana zero days a month, the predicted income would be 32,449. Okay. So I've got those interpretations kind of written down on this, this next slide, but I wanted to kind of make them and kind of look at these values and really think about what we're doing here. Okay. Now, I've got p values of zero, so I can reject the null hypothesis that the, where is it? I can reject this null hypothesis that the slope is equal to zero, right? Because I'm gonna have p value of zero, it's gonna be less than any alpha. So that's another example of kind of how we would do some interpretation. Now, I'll even show you, I think I have this, uh, so we have the interpretations here. And I had this slide in, but we've kind of jumped the gun uh, before I go to Excel for a second. We could do left or right tail test, but for the sake of this class, we're only, you know, the, the situations in which you use the right and left tail test are, are rare. We almost always start out just assuming that that slope is equal to zero and that we're trying to see whether or not it's anything other than zero. So 
we're always going to have the same hypothesis test when we do linear regression, which is that we assume that that slope is equal to zero, or we assume the intercept is equal to zero, and then we'll see if we can find, you know, if that's something other than zero, we can reject the null there as well. Okay. Uh, nope, I don't want to go on here. I wanted to show you this. I call, call this file weed wages so I could always identify it. Um, if we go to data, over to data analysis, we click on regression. Our Y variable was income. Now I'm going to show you something that can occur. So let's say instead of selecting the labels, I just selected the very first data point and I go down. And then what's my X variable? Number of days I use marijuana, but I don't select the label. The issue here is, so I didn't select labels, but if I run this regression, it just names the, the variable X variable one. Now we're not there yet, but eventually um, on Friday, we'll talk about, we can actually include multiple regressions, or sorry, multiple regression, multiple uh, right-hand side or X variables in our regression, which in that case, it just starts listing them X variable one, X variable two, and it's really hard to identify what these even mean, right? So kind of best practice is just to make sure that when we're running this regression, we always select that first kind of row, which is the labels of those, those variables. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do that now, just so we can see what that looks like. Actually, I've already got them selected. I'll just change this to one. Maybe, there we go. Selected the labels. Now we get our output. And these are the same values I was just showing you. So you could do it in Excel, you could do it in SATA, you could do it in SAS, there's a bunch of different programs. But all I'm gonna kind of rely or expect of you is to be able to look at this Excel output. So any output I use on the uh, on exam, make sure it kind of looks like either this Excel output or the output that I've been, I'll kind of start showing you in class here, which is this kind of STATA output as well. Or where was the other one? The, here we go, All right? Looks very similar, a little bit different layout, but giving me the same information. Okay. Any questions over that one before we keep moving? Go through one more example here and then we'll kind of switch over. Uh, I'll end on something. So what if I had this regression where I'm trying to predict birth weight using this variable of whether or not the mother smoked while pregnant. So this is what we sometimes call a dummy or an indicator variable. It's basically only ever a one or a zero. So it's a one if the mother smoked while pregnant, zero if not. Okay. So the interpretation gets a little bit trickier for these, but we'll walk through it. First things first, though, if I wanted to come up with a test statistic for that slope coefficient on smoking, and I didn't give it to you in the output, what would that test statistic be? And this should be easy. If you get answer, asked a question like this in the exam, from regression output, the way you find that test statistic is you simply take the coefficient and you divide it by the standard error, right? Oops. So if you do that, right, coefficient divided by the standard error, you get about negative 200 divided by about 50. So it's going to be around negative four. Well, the only one that's even close to negative four is D. If I go ahead and plug those values in my calculator, sure enough, I get negative 4.36. Okay. So I ask you for a test statistic. It's simply the coefficient divided by that standard error. Okay. Now, um, let's do some interpretation here. So how would I interpret this smoking variable? Well, usually we say it's for every one unit increase in our X variable, the predicted Y value changes by this coefficient. But what's a one unit increase? Well, my smoking variable was a zero if they didn't smoke and a one if they did smoke while pregnant. So a one unit increase would be going from being a zero to a one or not smoking while pregnant to smoking while pregnant. So the impact of going from not smoking to smoking while pregnant would predict that birth weight of the, of the child go down by 213 grams, right? Birth weight here was measured in grams. So the interpretation of these dummy or indicator variables, the one unit increase is just going from whatever group was a zero to whatever group is a one. So the group that was zero was mothers who didn't smoke while pregnant. The group was a one was those who did. So the effect of smoking while pregnant is it decreases predicted birth weights by 213 grams. How do we interpret the intercept or the concept, constant here? Well, it's if the X variable is equal to zero, our intercept is the predicted value of the Y variable. So if someone doesn't smoke while pregnant, the predicted 
kind of birth weight for that individual would be 3,427. Just a couple more uh, examples of kind of how we do this interpretation, you know, looking at, you know, you know talking about how we calculate test statistics. Um, yeah, I think, like I said, we'll just keep going through, getting a lot more practice here on Friday and next week with this as well. Uh, oh, I didn't want to do this, did I? Oh yeah, I did. I'll write out this equation first. So the next thing that we're gonna look at in Excel, I'm gonna just write it out here so we have something to reference and I might use this in a little bit is let's say I wanted to predict somebody's weight using kind of their height, okay? Now I had these formulas. Let me go back. Actually, I think I put them back on here again. I did, I just copy and pasted the same stuff. So I had this formula that I could compute what that slope coefficient is. So I'm gonna show you how I do this in Excel. So the first thing I wanna do is for every observation, Take the X value, subtract the mean of the X value, multiply that by that observation's Y value minus the average Y. So I'm gonna open this linear regression height and weight completed file. This is up on Canvas as well. So I'm just gonna look at the data tab. I've got individuals height and weight. So what I did over here, calculated the average height, right? Or my average X variable was height. Calculated the average weight. That was my mean for the Y variable. I then went through every observation. I just said, okay, take the first person's height and subtract the average height. Then take that person's weight, subtract the average weight. Multiply those two differences by each other and then do that for every observation. If I then add all those up, right, take the sum of those, that'll give me my numerator, right? That was basically giving me this numerator, okay? If I then go back and I want my denominator, well, I'm gonna take the difference between the observation's X value and the average X, and I'm just gonna square that deviation from the mean. I'm gonna do that for every observation and then add them all up. That would give me my denominator here, okay? Once, oops, I didn't wanna do that. Once I do that, I then divide that numerator by the denominator and that should give me my slope coefficient, okay? So you can do all the work by hand if you really wanted to. I don't know why you would be interested in doing this, um, but if I would have simply used that built-in regression tool, my X variable, sorry, actually, I think I selected the Y variable first, didn't I? Yeah, my Y variable, should be weight, so I'll highlight that. My X variable should be height, so I'll select that. Once again, control shift and the down arrow is how I'm doing this quickly. I selected my labels, I hit okay. I get this coefficient of 4.7138, which if I did this all by hand, 4.7138, I find the exact same thing, right? So basically this built-in tool is just Excel doing all of this work behind the scenes, okay? I won't ask you to do this like on the Excel assignment. Um, basically the Excel assignment is just gonna be running some different regressions, right? So I've got the regression results here. I, I recreated them for you. Um, one thing we're gonna do next class, since I have a couple seconds here, first of all, uh, like I said, I kind of just copy and pasted these slides in here again. So we have the equations to look at if I ended up doing this in Excel. We'll kind of pick up on multiple linear regression next class. So I'm just going to show you ahead of time what we're going to be doing. We, we haven't discussed the issues that this will present. But basically, uh, you know, I have a variable here that I believe is a, a one if they're male, zero if not. So let me see if I go to data analysis. Uh, no, hold on. I need, I'm going to insert a column here. And I'm just going to move these two things around so I can show you something. So we'll go to data analysis, we'll hit regression. My Y variable is weight. So I select weight. What we can actually do is, well, I know that height might be a good predictor of weight, but 
so are other things, right? There's a lot of other things that might influence kind of what your weight is. So not just your height, but maybe gender or maybe, uh, you know, I don't know what country you live in. So here we don't have a lot of information, but we have kind of gender and height. So I'm going to select those two variables and it's going to now include two variables that help me predict weight. Okay. So next class, what we're going to talk about is, you know, we know a lot more than just one thing matters. When we're trying to predict weight, a lot more than just height matters. If we're trying to predict GPA, more than just SAT scores matter, right? So how do we control for multiple things or use multiple things to predict a Y value, right? Or whatever Y variable we're looking at. So we'll kind of can see it's pretty easy to run the regression in Excel, right? I just select the more variables to put on the right hand side. But what does that really mean? That's what we'll kind of dive into uh, beginning on Friday. Okay. Any other questions for me? Otherwise, we'll kind of end it there for today. You good? All right. We'll see you guys on Friday.